All right, I bring spring greetings to you, my well-informed and ever-growing cohort of Hurley Burleyites. What a podcast we have for you today. A two-parter, chock full of of edge-of-your-Chesterfield Canadian poly content. We do not sit on couches or sofas here at the Hurley Burley, only Chesterfields. Part one, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Michelle Rempel-Garner to the show. You all know Ms. Rempel-Garner as the Conservative member for Calgary Nose Hill and health critic for the Conservative Party, a major force within that party. We're going to delve a little deeper into her background today, why she got involved and what motivates her. We'll also talk about what it's like to have such a big social media presence and what she thinks the Conservative Party should be doing to win. Part two of the pod is what you expect part two of this pod to be. Our political panel with Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne. So damn consistent you could set your watch by it. We're going to pick up on the conversation with Ms. Rempel-Garner. We'll dive right into just about everything that went down during the Conservative Convention this past weekend. According to Aaron O'Toole, this isn't your father's Conservative Party, but should it be? We'll also take the natural opportunity to compare and contrast party platforms as the discussion unwinds. And of course, we'll throw out our hey yous out into the void. Stick around for that. Michelle Rempel-Garner, I want to welcome you to the Hurley Burley. Thank you for uh, being on the show today. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Well, I know you're super busy and we did this on short notice. So thanks. Thanks for making the time. Right. No. Hey, you're in Ottawa right now. Yes, I am in Ottawa. Yeah. Yeah. How are you? How are you doing during this whole pandemic thing? Over a year now, we celebrated it the year with drinks last weekend, last week, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think I just choose to be to, to focus on things that I'm grateful for. There are things that are have been tough for me personally over the last year uh, within my own circumstance. But um, I know that there's a lot of other Canadians that don't have some of the privileges that I do. So, uh, you know, it's, it's at this point, it's really about a year into this figuring out how we move forward so that um, Hopefully, uh, sooner than a year from now, we're cheersing with drinks on life being somewhat back to normal. But thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's hit my family hard, too. This has been a tough year. Yeah. Tough, tough year, personally. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about you a little bit. How did you get involved in politics? I'm always curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I... I I was basically out on my own at 17 years old and I uh, put myself through school. I got married really What do you young. mean? What like do you mean I, you were out on your own? Um, like I moved out. Uh, my, my parents divorced okay. when I was 17 and this is all material. I trust me. Um, and I, I paid my way through school. Um, you know, I worked several jobs and, you know, I resident managed an apartment building on the weekend. Um, and I guess for me, I was working really hard um, and I just, I became politically active. There's a couple of inciting incidences for me. First of all was our liberal MP came to my high school when I was young and I was just really Who was that? It was Reg Alcock. Who was that? Reg Alcock, Winnipeg South. May he rest in peace. And every liberal can uh, (laughs) curse his name uh, because he he really got me involved in politics. Him and (laughs) and and also um, like also Ralph Goodale um, because I watched like I, I was just so struck. He came to the high school and he was just so like entitled, like that's not a word I perhaps would have used at that point, but just like, so I'm like, what is this? Like, this is not my living situation. And then I kind of remember watching uh, Ralph Goodale gave this like terrible interview on TV. I couldn't place exactly what network it was on or anything. I just, I think it was in the middle of the like pre-sponsorship scandal or something. And I just, I, 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 and I just was like, there's gotta be something better, right? And the, you know, the reform party was sort of starting at that point in time. Um, uh, like I wasn't really involved in any of the legacy parties, um, but I started getting politically active. Like I started like just out of nowhere looking at ways to get involved. And that uh, really took off when I moved to Calgary in 2004. I uh, got involved. From in, where, Michelle? From where? From Winnipeg. From Winnipeg. From Winnipeg. So yeah. I... Uh, yeah. 
I got involved with uh, Diana Blonsi's riding association. And, you know, within a year, I was her vice president. I was helping work on her campaign. I was traveling back and forth to Winnipeg. Like, even though I was working full time, I was using my vacation time to manage campaigns. And um, I think the reason why it was so incredible for me was even though I was working full time, I, you know, had a, a really rewarding and, and I was career like day job and was doing well. It was the ability to affect change as a young woman. It was something that gave me control over my circumstance, but also the ability to, to do something impactful for the community. And I think, you know, that to me, that's a currency for me. It's the ability to impact change for the better for, for people around you. I, and I know that sounds sort of cliche, but it's not for me. It's, it's still my re reason for being in politics. And um, the other thing I'll say is I was, the door was wide open. I mean, there was no barriers put in my way. It was Get, you want to work? Great. And, you know, by the time I was 27, I was chairing our national policy committee. I was Diane's EDA president. I had run several campaigns. You know, I got to know Jenny Byrne, who's regularly on your show. Um, and then when uh, the, and, and, and uh, my career had gone really well. I had won my top 100 most powerful women award prior to entering politics. Um, really, I was working at the University of Calgary uh, in 2010 and Jim Prentice unexpectedly retired. And um, I remember, you know, Jenny giving me a call and a couple of others and say, you know, you're ready for this. You're well positioned to do it. You should go. Um, and I kind of haven't looked back and I've always measured the why and why I ran by ability to affect change. Uh, and, and I, I, th I think I'm still doing that. Um, but the minute that I think, I think when people lose the plot in politics is when they stop seeking to affect change and just, you know, sort of start seeking to win. Michelle, why did you choose a conservative party to get involved in politics? And so you wanted to get involved in politics. You wanted change. Um, you wanted to be empowered in that way. Um, and you looked to the reform or CPC wing. What, what, what about your background or thinking led you to that choice? Well, I was, I was working three jobs as a young woman to pay my way through school. And all I saw was rich liberals on TV. And I'm like, this isn't right. Th these people don't represent who I am. And um, to the point where I felt compelled to work against them. Um, I, I just think that, you know, you know, when I think about former liberal Jody Wilson-Raybould, I mean, I think she represents the best of what the Liberal Party can be in terms of, you know, pushing for social justice and uh, pushing for change and equity. But then I look at, um, you know, the, the worst of the Liberal Party, uh, which is, you know, I think largely a vehicle to enrich um, and, and, and maintain the status quo within, you know, elite old money power circles in Canada. And that was everything I was not. It was everything that I was not living in my lived experience. Um, and so that's why I choose, chose to run for the Conservative Party. And now no, any partisan who, I know you, you are well aware of this, uh, any partisan who who will come to you and say, oh, well, my party's 100% great and everything's wonderful. I don't think that's reality. But at that point in time, and I would say still today, given that I'm an Alberta MP, um, the Conservatives are more closely aligned with what I need, the, the political philosophy I need to protect the interests of the people I represent. Okay. So can I understand this a little bit? It wasn't left wing, right wing. It wasn't small government versus big government spending versus restraint. It was insider, outsider? No, I wouldn't characterize it that way. I would just say um, p politicians inspire or <laughs> the opposite based on their actions. And when I was starting to my political awakening, if you will, um, I really think it was it was the tail end of a very entitled, out of touch liberal government that was not materially making my life uh, better as a young woman who was, you know, trying to make my way in the world without uh, a lot of support, no support. Um, and I'm like, what is this right. government doing for me? Right? Um, I I don't think that's insider outsider. I think it's. I'm seeing a bunch of people like governing to get rich for their friends. What about me? 
right? And I was starting to, like, I was paying taxes at that point too, right? I'm like, what the hell is this? Um, so I, I just, um, and a lot of like, because that was really when I think the, the right of center movement in Canada was going through a bit of a renaissance, right? That's really when, you know, the Reform Party, the Canadian Alliance were starting to talk about like, well, who, who are we? What do we do? What are we, um, what, why are we existing? And um, it was, you know, in some ways an exciting time. Um, what is it, um, what is it that a young woman like yourself who was, uh, trying to make a go of it, um, what, what kind of supports were you looking for? Like, what do you think government should have been doing to make your life better? Get out of my way. Time? Get out of my way. Okay. No, I like, like, <laughs> I remember the first time I looked at my paycheck and I'm like, holy shit, like it's a lot of tax. Like that's like, that's like, can I go grocery shopping this week or not? Right. And um, I, I just like, to me, like, I think that there's like, I, I know like, you know, it's funny. This is actually the first time I've had this conversation in this way of me as a young, like poverty line single woman trying to put myself through school and my then husband as well. Like I should be, I should be the, the, the like, like picture of a liberal voter. And I wasn't. Um, and I think that it's, it's an assumption that, um, you know, so like, what sort of supports did you need? Um, like why is government intervention the, or government programming always the, the answer to that solution? Like, like in terms of outreach, uh, where I needed help, it was local community organizations that I know were not being and still aren't being supported by government. Um, so, so uh, like all I'm saying is I'm not I'm not arguing against the need for a strong social safety net. I, the opposite. I mean, like I think the fact that you know in Canada we've got a strong publicly funded healthcare system. Obviously, that helped somebody like me. Um, but sometimes we also need to support uh, like, or, 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 or to say that like government intervention isn't always the solution, right? So, you know, for me, it was just get out of my way and let me work, right? Okay. Who are some people in politics that you've really admired? You know, I, I've been asked this question before and um, the people I really admired are, are people who who just worked really hard behind the scenes? Um, one of the the people who was re instrumental in my political career is is not known on the Canadian <laughs> scene at all. She's one of my she's the first person that I interacted with in Calgary in the conservative organization. Her name's Arlene Carlson, and she's she's now in I think her late sixties, and she just volunteers all the time, and she's probably elected more people than you know, anybody I know, my, my friend, Lynn Walker, these are women that like, they are in it to affect change in the community and they sit there and they work and they door knock and they make phone calls and they, you know, they, when I decided to run, they're the ones who are yeah. phoning me and saying, you can do this. So those are the people I, I admire, people who um, understand that in the Canadian political context, it's not just about clicks and likes or photo ops. It's about putting your hand to the plow. It doesn't matter what, what party you're in. Uh, and I often think that a lot of those people don't get the credit that they deserve. Right. Um, well, no, it's true. They don't get any credit and they're, they're the backbone of organizations. I was talking about somebody last week who was very important in my life that way. Um, speaking about back in Calgary. Yeah. I know the, I know the economy in Calgary is in bad shape. Alberta seems like it's in a terrible mood right now. What's going on out in Alberta? Yeah, I'm going to start by saying let's address the post-convention issue. Climate change is real and we need to address it. I wish that Justin Trudeau would understand that he can't make policy happen to one region of the country, that he has to have policy happen with every region of the country. And that's why Alberta is so fucking pissed right now 
It's because for the last five years, every policy decision that has happened under the Trudeau Liberal government has happened to us under stereotypes and under almost punitive circumstances. And, and this is a sentiment that does not have a right-left boundary. It's, it's a sense that the, you know, the power structure of Canada, the, you know, the civil service, lobbyists, government, diplomatic corps, press gallery, it's concentrated in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. And there are so many people within that community that, for, first of all, maybe have never even been to Western Canada, let alone live there or from there, that it's just, there's this sense that it's like just things just happen to us and that we're just going to sit and take it. And that is not, that's not how you knit together a federation. So when it comes to environmental policy, right, the, true, the hallmark of the Trudeau Liberal government has been, well, dirty Alberta jobs, like they just need to get over themselves and sell their trucks and uh, get on with life. OK, literally, like, I mean, that's what I hear in Ottawa and that's what my constituents, they know that's what the conversation is out here. And, you know, so, so instead of having a conversation that starts like this, like, look, um, where where is a country going to move to X target on greenhouse gas emissions over this period of time? So what does that mean for the energy sector? Well, um, you know, we're we're going to incent uh, carbon capture sequestration technology or other other you know, short term solutions so that Canadian energy can be part of a transition to a clean economy over a certain period of time. Um, here's, here's what we're going to do for workforce training. Here's what we're going to do to create, create macroeconomic conditions to uh, allow for um, new industries to emerge in the province. It's basically like this, fuck you. There's no conversation. And, right. and, and Trudeau benefits from that. It's like, I see it. He takes glee and pleasure in in, 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 in like almost sticking it to the province and people feel that. And like, like at this point in time, it's not like, oh, we just want in. That was the sentiment 30 years ago. It's blinding anger and rage that we, after contributing to the country for generations are not even at the fucking table. Like, like in any way, like shape or form and that there's no desire to put us there. Um, and that, that to me is like, that's what it's so wrong. Like e th th there's so many assumptions, false assumptions based into that. There's so much arrogance based into that approach. And that's what needs to change. Like it needs to change for the, for the, for the betterment of every person in this country. So I actually agree with everything you've just said. Um, I actually agree with everything you've just I, everything you've just said. The most obvious response to it that people listening will have is, "Well, they bought a pipeline." Oh, What's that's so oversimplified. That? That's so oversimplified. I mean, okay, so they their environmental the Trudeau government's environmental constituency hates that pipeline. Okay, but like again, a, a responsible government would say. Okay, Canada, most of our energy is transported on rail right now. That is not safe. Okay, so we're not going to magically transition. You need to purposefully transition over time to clean energy if that's the objective. We are using carbon energy. We're using carbon products. We shouldn't be putting that on rail. We should be putting it in state-of-the-art a highly, highly secure infrastructure so that we can monitor the transport of that. Um, number one. It's the best number argument two. for Energy East. Pardon? It's the best argument for Energy East. Absolutely. Uh, and I mean, like, the other argument for Energy East is, you know, why are we, why are we importing oil from Saudi? Right. right. I mean, that's a conversation that honestly, like, like it, 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 it touches on a lot of issues that nobody wants to talk about, including, you know, a certain family from out east that makes a lot of money refining Saudi oil. Um, it, it touches on. Um, like you mean the government of New Brunswick? You mean the <laughs> effective, the effective government of New Brunswick? I'm just, I'm just saying. I, <laughs> like, like nobody wants to have this difficult, spicy conversation. Every and and you know, and people across the country, like, like, it's just like there's no plan. Like if Trudeau had stood up and said. Here's the plan, right? Um, 
and brought people along, um, I, I would, you know, it's like, it's okay. That's something that we can debate and work with. Uh, not that I'm agreeing to, you know, from his perspective of shutting down the energy sector to be very clear. Um, but I, I think what happened, if I had to surmise, he learned from his father and was like, I'm not going to call shutting down the energy sector, national energy program, the second, I'm not going to give a political focus. His policy has been hallmarked by just not making decisions and creating a regulatory environment in which projects just die. Like they don't make decisions, right? So like nobody wants to invest in Canada right now. And to me, that's just so short-sighted, uh, both from an energy security perspective, uh, from an overall plan, um, uh, an environmental plan, uh, North American, uh, you know, integrated economic union perspective, um, sovereignty in, in light of cha the changing geopolitical situation, like dumb, 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 terrible. Um, but it's politically expedient, and that's why he's doing it. And that's why I'm a conservative, is I hate bullshit political expediency uh, from 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 the Liberal Party. Honestly, it just it's it's the hallmark over and over again. I just have to smile when you say that because you're probably talking about me. But anyway, um, the <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so I said I believe everything that you said about how the oil producing provinces have not been involved in the plan and are not being fully calibrated or appropriately calibrated terms of what we ought to do to help those provinces do this transition. I agree with that 100%. I also believe this. I believe that the scientific consensus is that we are in a race against time to stop adding to the stockpile of CO2 in the atmosphere and that that's a time-limited fight and we've got only a few decades to try to get this right before we start to make the conditions for future generations unsustainable. So I have those two things in my head. Do you believe the second thing, what I just said? I absolutely do. Absolutely do. And I think, David, where um, th where I find the debate on climate policy lacking or like the ability to address that 100% correct concern that you just stated is that the, the measures that are being proposed to address that reality don't take into consideration the broader socioeconomic upheaval issues of, uh, uh, of that quick a transition off of carbon. And I'm not talking just about the jobs in my writing. I'm looking at the global context, right? Like there's ethical concerns about, okay, well, if we like just completely decarbonize the country or, or the world, what does that mean for emerging economies? What does that mean for transport? What does it mean for social unrest? What does it mean for health outcomes? And I don't like, I don't think that the climate debate has really talked, it's talked about the human aspect in terms of what happens given that our planet is burning, one, right? But it's not talking about how to address the social unrest that occurs with when you when you when you change tack so quickly on something as fundamental as how we consume energy or the energy we consume. And what we've just been talking about for the last little bit with regard to Alberta is such a small microcosm of that, right? So like a smart government would acknowledge what you just said, but also acknowledge what I just said and come up with policy that marries both. And nobody's gonna be happy with that. But when you're dealing with an emergency, as much as we are in the pandemic right now, if you are managing to getting reelected and you don't have political courage, you are managing to the wrong thing. And I think, you know, it, it, I felt your urgency and like, you're, you're like, we got to get this right on that. And I agree with you, but there needs to be like, like there needs to be courage on this issue um, and there needs to be equity. And um, I wish that the debate wasn't so caricaturized. I wish it wasn't so dogmatically one way or the other, or that even uh, like that people weren't so adherent to rigid silos and that we were looking towards innovative solutions that addressed everything as opposed to just sort of staying in this rut of political dogma. So that's what I think needs to change first. So you've probably heard a lot in the news recently about a big development in the telco space. For our presenting sponsor, TELUS, getting better is far more important than getting bigger, specifically delivering better service and the best networks for their customers. Here's what I mean. TELUS has been investing in spectrum, infrastructure, and operations for over 20 years now. 
nearly $240 billion. In the last 12 years, an extraordinary $6 billion in spectrum alone. Spectrum are the radio waves on which all of our mobile data travels. So more and more Canadians are connected at faster and faster speeds, particularly critical for our rural and remote communities as well as Indigenous lands. Right now, though, government sets aside billions of dollars worth of subsidized spectrum, effectively giving deep discounts to well-established cable companies with healthy balance sheets because they're classified as new entrants. But these companies are not held accountable to build networks in rural communities or even use the spectrum for rural broadband. So way too much of the spectrum that can help solve the connectivity gap for rural Canadians and Indigenous peoples goes unused. While those other companies focus on merging themselves, TELUS wants to put that spectrum to use today, unlock it, and work in partnership with government to get it all done as fast as possible. The end game needs to be putting that spectrum to use, not subsidizing mergers and the billionaire families that own the companies, so that every Canadian can get better access to health care, education, and all the advantages of high-speed internet through TELUS's world-class network never more important than it is right now. Go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca to learn more. Um, let's talk about COVID for a few minutes. Oh, great. Well, you've been at the center of this and you are yeah. now leading a new discussion. And you are now leading a new discussion. I read your op-ed in the in the Star and Sun, sorry, yesterday. Um, and um, so before we get into that specific proposal, how would you characterize the government's handling of COVID overall? I think I gave you a good uh, segue from my last comment. It's in an emergency situation, you need to look at how, how governing works a little different, right? And I think, you know, at the, you know this, at the best of times, you know, bureaucracy is slow, it's not nimble, it's, it's quick to talk you know, about status quo process. And really what we needed in the last year was the political will to say, look, we're still going to, for example, we're still going to have um, quality and, and a high level of rigor in our regulatory process for medical products, but it can't take three years. And we have to, like, what resources do we need to do this faster? So like that lack of political will, I think, set us back on rapid tests, on procurement of vaccines, um, didn't allow us to um, look at manufacturing capacity for new vaccine technologies in Canada. I think, um, I, I also think that the, the, the government didn't take this seriously for the first three months. Um, and documents that have emerged because of, you know, motions I've put forward suggest that. Like they weren't, it wasn't until the end of March that they were like, oh, maybe we should shut the border down. And it was, you know, like, I, I just remember that press conference with Patty Hadji going, well, you know, it actually makes things worse. And it's like, what? I remember them issuing mask advice going like, well, you know, we're not sure this works. And I'm thinking, putting a covering over the holes on your body in which it comes out like it can't, it can't be a bad thing. Like, so like, I just, like, I don't, you know, to me, like just as a pundit and not as a like legislator, like to me, uh, observing it, it, it was very clear that the, the public service and God bless the public service, but the public service is managing the cabinet in this government, not the other way around, because in this situation, you, you need to be giving political directive to change processes so that they're responding quickly to an emergency. And also, I think the other thing that has macro level that's really hampered this government is the desire to just offload responsibility uh, to the provincial governments. I'm not saying interfere in jurisdiction, but like it's been like, well, it's Doug Ford's fault or pick anybody, John Horgan's fault, right? Or they can do this. And it's like, well, why? So what is it that you would say you would do here, right? Like the question of like, well, why, why, like, why do we have a federal government then? And arguably, you know, the, the lack of coordination on data sharing has set our country back. I mean, it, it, like David, like if you get your vaccine, if you somehow get a vaccine, you know, like how are we reg registering that so that somebody can have proof of vaccination? Like, it's just, um, it, it's been piss poor. How about that? <laughs> 
Okay. You support the CERB and the wage subsidy, though, right? Those were pretty big ideas, pretty big well, pretty I mean, big supports if, if, if for the, the economy. Government, if the government is, I don't think those are partisan initiatives. I, I, it, they, the government needed, every level of government needed to put restrictions in place a year ago to buy time to figure out what was going on and, and how to manage the situation. I think every Canadian... Uh, realize that, but we also needed to ensure that when the government's saying we are making a decision to essentially shut everything down, that people are supported. The question now becomes we're a year into this. So is it reasonable to continue full economic lockdowns? Like we should, like now that we have tools like vaccines, rapid tests, therapeutics, better data, I like, like, I, I like, I think we need to start having the conversation. Like, I don't, I don't think this should be spicy about how we move forward safely. Is it a bit early? Is it a bit early? I mean, I read the op-ed and I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know, the cases are rising every day in Ontario and BC and places like that. And, not, I'm and not the new, va new variants are, new variants are emerging. Is this, and the vaccines are just coming opening. to place? Is this... Okay. This is not I'm, not, I'm not asking for Texas. I don't want Texas. I, this is what I'm asking for. It is not too early for the government to be telling Canadians what research and benchmarks they're putting in place. Like, like to, 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 to re reopen. That's all we're saying is like, so for example, classic question, right? I asked Patty Haiju, like, can a fully vaccinated Canadian senior give their grandchild a hug? The C CDC has issued advice on this, right? So the CDC is coming out and they're saying, okay, here's what vaccinated persons can do, right? And she's like, well, that's actually the provincial government's responsibility, but we might give advice and I don't know. So, uh, that's not acceptable. Like, so, so when you talk about the government's response... You're just picking on the weakest link. You're just picking on the weakest link. Okay, but like... <laughs> like, then... Like, honestly, like, I, I don't care. Like, I this is too big for that, right? I, and I, I think it's not, like, are you kidding me? It's not too early to be talking about what benchmarks we're using, especially under vaccination for, for reopening. That's just bananas. It, you know, I, I like, what, what was the federal government going to say? Like, it's another two, three years of this. Like it's a, it's a, we're, we're, we're fundamentally changing the structure of our society because uh, we don't have a plan. That's, that's no, that's, that's like, uh, mental health, but, but also better public health outcomes. I mean, uh, we should be talking about this in terms of let's, let's talk about one area that needs to be talked about long-term care. I mean, what's, what's happened in long-term care. Nobody wants to talk about it in Canada. It's an atrocity. I it's do. an atrocity. It's it, it, like we need to fix this and we need a plan going forward that includes that now. It's not too soon for that. It was too late for that when the military was called in. And the fact that like we're 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 beating around the bush. Every political stripe is beating around the bush on this kind of doing this dance with jurisdiction. It's criminal. Like like so it's But it's not, not a dance. It's not it's not a dance, Michelle. I mean those things fall into provincial jurisdiction, right? The feds could not have told Jason Kenney or Francois Legault how to run their LTC homes any more, any more than they can tell Francois Legault or Jason Kenney when they should open their province and how. I'm not suggesting that, you know, jurisdictional responsibility be overridden, but like, why isn't the federal government, you know, you talk about where ways that government intervention can help. How come we're yeah. not... We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on just like everything. Like, where's where's funding or restructuring of existing federal funds to allow for uh, LTC facilities to apply for better infrastructure? Or why aren't we directing like um, like like why aren't we why aren't we? There's there's at least five or six different things that the federal government could be doing to support provinces in a decision on how to move forward, right? To give them extra tools. Like, it's kind of like somebody's house is flooding and you just watching it happen and not going there and saying, how can I help, right? That's different than saying, you know, like, 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 like impeding an authority. And I guess I just feel this sense of just not wanting to touch the problem from the federal government, as opposed to saying, this is a national tragedy that we need we need to provide support to the provincial governments. I don't see this as a political, like, finger-pointing exercise. I see it as an exercise of humanity that, that they we're just like, well, like, I've, I've met with several of the worker associations, 
And those have been some of my hardest political meetings. Like it, it takes a lot to reduce me to tears on a meeting. And I just, how is this happening in Canada? Right. Right. Um, what do you think happened in long-term care? We don't like to talk about death. So I think it starts with this taboo. Um, and, you know, you see it in the, d- the debate around medically assisted dying, palliative care. Like, it's just like this icky thing. It's like, ooh, I kind of want to talk about this. And I think that because of that, it's a, just an area of policy that is typically ignored. And we're having, like, between the debate around medically assisted dying and, and your support for, for, for elderly patients and you know, an aging Canadian population, we have to have this conversation. We have to be like, what does dignity look like for, for, for an elderly person in Canada? And what is the state's role in that? And, and, I, and I, I think that because that conversation has not been had in any significant way, we are now reacting to emergent situations as opposed to, you know, looking at something that should have been dealt with 20, 30 years ago, or at least starting to think about it. But on, on a positive note, like I, I will say that um, regardless of how somebody feels about the debate on medically assisted dying, it's it's brought to the forefront this issue, right? Um, and certainly, you know, the, the tragedies that have unfolded over the last year in long-term care across the country, I think have brought to the forefront that as a country, we have to, we have to talk about this. Uh, and I think within federal jurisdiction, the federal government has to... Um, and all political parties have to ask, how are we supporting, how are we supporting provinces in addressing this challenge in a meaningful way? So um, that's what I, I I know that's more of an esoteric answer, but I I think that we just shy away from, we've shied away from this conversation. Well, yeah, but what does it say about us and what are we going to do? Like, I mean, these homes were awful before COVID. They were a disgrace before COVID. They were places nobody wanted to live in and nobody would have wanted their loved one to live in. And horrible conditions, um, loneliness, uh, you talk about mental health, people in those places. Um, I mean, what's an alternative? Like, how should we be treating our elderly? What should we, what, what's a better approach? I think this is such a worthy conversation, first of all. Um, I, ha- I think we have to realize, too, that there's no prescriptive answer to that question when you look at it from the lens of Canada being a pluralism. There's going to be different cultural contexts in which um, how, how people believe aging should happen. Um, there's going to be different realities based on what part of the country you live. If you live in rural Canada versus uh, in an urban center, if you're on reserve or if you're not. And so I need. I think, first of all, we need to have policy that meets people where they're at. So by that, you know, if somebody wants to age in place, how do we how do we support that? How do we support that choice, right? How do we support? Uh, you know, we we spend a lot of time talking about childcare. We don't spend a lot of time talking about, um, you know, somebody. You know, I, I'm not quite at that age yet, but I will be probably in ten years, where I'm I'm going to be providing care to my my parents, right, or my family. So how do we? Um, help people that are providing care within a familial situation. Uh, And then for those who are in long-term care facilities, because that is needed, you know, I I do think we need a collaborative approach with the federal government and provinces to support better decision-making. That framework doesn't exist right now. That's low-hanging fruit. We could put that in place. Uh, And then we need input from the, the service providers. And yes, investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. But I will say this, What I don't want to see is just like the announcement of like, oh, we're spending a hundred billion dollars on this with no, without it being tied to outcome. Um, Because this is like, like as much as you had felt that urgency with the climate debate, this is a very urgent problem in Canada and any, any new funding has to be tied to some sort of outcome within the context of jurisdiction. So, you know, I would start by putting that framework in place, I would have it driven by long-term care providers, families, residents, um, provincial governments. And uh, I think that like, if, if you lit a fire, we could have something, you know, in, in, in a quarter, why not? Right. So um, I just hope that Canadians understand that this is something we have to fix 
we, we have to fix it now. We should have had it fixed before all this happened. But certainly in light of what we saw in the last year, this is not something that can be ignored by any level of government. I worry it's going away, Michelle. I, I, you know, I would have thought last spring when this all started to go down that Canadians seeing what was happening in those homes would have reached for their torches and pitchforks. Um, and they told pollsters that they were angry, but I sense that the country's turned away from that issue again. I, I don't know. I, um, I, I, I think that, you know, David, our country is kind of going through a bit of a collective trauma right now. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of people who are like at basic survival mode um, and are dealing with this issue from the perspective of them having family in long-term care, but also trying to figure out like, okay, how do I, I don't have a job. How am I paying the mortgage next month? Or, um, you know, my kids having behavioral issues because they haven't been in school for two years or uh, like, like the people I talk with in my community, it's like, this it's survival mode. I've never seen anything like this. It's like, so it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's less about this going away as an issue, but the, the need for us to like deal with, you know, like collective societal problems right now. And going back to your question on like, don't you think we should be talking about a plan to move forward? Yeah, no, we need to do that now for that reason, right? Can we move off of this lofty moral territory and talk about politics? <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> All right, let's do her. Let's do her. Why was the Conservative Party divided going into its convention? Okay. And Break particularly for- divided, wait, wait a second, particularly divided over its leadership. Because normally uh-huh. that happens when a defeated leadership candidate is trying to relitigate the results. And I didn't sense any hand from Peter McKay in any of this. Um, But yet it was clear that going into the convention, O'Toole had issues with the party. Well, I mean, he certainly had issues of, you know, a few uh, nameless anonymous people, you know, talking in gossip columns for sure. Um, no, wait, I, I got to stop you. I got to stop you, Michelle. He had Jenny on this show with her face. Okay, well, attached Jenny, to it. I, you know, I'm of the Jenny Byrne school of political management, which is I'm aggressive, aggressive. I'm not passive aggressive. And if I have something to say, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, so, so if I've got a problem, I'm, I, I'm not shy about putting my name to it. I, as, and I know that Jenny's philosophy as well, too. Um, so, you know, just on that, you know, to colleagues that were, were in some of those, columns it's like but anyway I <laughs> I how do we move forward here's here's like just assessing some of the challenges um we had a leadership during a pandemic it was extra protracted um the leader came into uh and this is not excuses I'm just sort of doing an environmental scan uh, leader came into um caucus we really haven't had any in-person interaction with the new leader roles have changed um, and and people are at home in their ridings, right? And, and and the other thing is a lot of caucuses, like I know for me dropping out of warp, warp speed, like I was on a plane, you know, 20 hours a week prior to this all over the country doing stuff, like it was a big change. And I think for some of our colleagues, like, like, like you know, and, and the leader, like you're, you're figuring out how to operate in, in this new context. So I think that's that's a challenge. And also, how do you get media attention and known as a leader um, in this new operating environment, too? I think those are all challenges that we had. Um, and I also think, you know, it's it, it, the difficulty of not knowing when Trudeau is going to force an election is in, in that, that context. It's like, OK, well, do we have another six months for him to get known to the Canadian public or not? I think he underst- I think Aaron understands that uh, our leader. I thought he gave a really good speech at the convention. Um, um, but like now, um, what we need to do is focus on a, a, on our election platform um, from the perspective of like showing Canadians what a conservative government would look like. And there's nothing that unifies caucus more than saying like here here's the direction that we're rowing to. So I was really glad to see. Um, some direction given uh, in in his speech, and uh, 
you know, now it's, you know, looking around and saying, pick up the oars and, and let's get moving. Okay. One thing in the speech really interested me, and that was the open invitation to Quebec separatists and nationalists to embrace the CPC and to say, listen, we agree with you on the role of Quebec in the Federation. We agree with you on uh, no strings attached funding and the bloc can never get you what you want. If you are somebody that does not agree with the Trudeau vision of federalism, come with us. Uh, I thought it was interesting for two reasons. One of which is it's a real Quebec strategy, so uh, which is something I didn't see out of the party in the last election campaign. So this is a real strategy that may bear fruit in Quebec. The second thing is I can't really think of anything that would piss off an original Reform Party supporter more than that. But like, like, original Reform Party supporter, I mean, we're 30 years, and I think that original Reform Party supporters, um, you know, understand that the country grows and changes. And I, I don't, like, I appreciate the fact that our party like is 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 looking to have an electoral strategy that brings in every region of the country, right? We have to have that. Um, as much as, you know, I am always going to be a large pain in the ass for my province. Like, I am an un, unrepentant advocate for Alberta. I refuse to let our province not be part of the conversation in the context that we discussed before. So... A true national government means you bring in every part of the country, understanding that there are regional differences, um, regional needs, but you stitch that together in a way that you're you're not squashing one region to the benefit of the other. And and I like we have to do that. Every political party has to show that they they have a viable plan to do that in the next election. And um, you know I, I think that's the spirit of where the outreach is coming from. Okay. You're pro-choice, right? Yes. Yeah. And you support LGBTQ rights? Um, that's a, putting it mildly, but yes. <laughs> right. Right. So how would you... And I mean, you I, I also, like, like, to me, it's, it's more of a question of just equality, right? Um, I want to support a woman who chooses to have a child in the same way I want to choose to support a woman who does not. Um, and I just like, I, I like, like the fact that we're just, you're even asking me these questions kind of gets my back up, right? It's like one of these things where we like, do we still have to ha ask those questions? Why can't we ask like how we protect those? I don't right? call it. Okay. But I'm not call I'm not asking you to judge anything or even to discuss the policy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's back in politics zone. How, what I wanted to ask you was how would you convince people in, say, Toronto or elsewhere who aren't certain that they can count on your party to defend those things? With action, right? But um, no, between now and the next election, yeah, how will you convince them? With, with action, with, with like, right out their policy on here's, here's what we're doing to advance and support uh, policies that prevent discrimination against the, the queer community in Canada. Here's what we're doing. Like, here's how we're going to end the blood ban. Here's how we're going to address uh, homeless LGBTQ youth issues. Here's how we're going to uh, promote more participation in the workforce of, you know, BIPOC persons. Here's here's what we're going to do to address childcare um, and and uh, for women. Here's how we're going to address poverty in marginalized communities. Recognizing that um, poverty and inequality. Um, it has it, there, there are intersectional issues that that you need to have tailored and customized responses to, and just like acknowledging that it exists, and then put stuff in the window. Um, you know, since we're being frank, I mean, the last campaign was really hard for me because, like, like, like I, we should be openly talking about this is who who our country is. Like, like everybody cares about this. Everybody wants this. I want this. I'm a woman. I want to see myself. And I, I guess what has been good is in the last year, I have seen, um, you know, like, like it's, it's gotten better. Uh, and, and I don't think, like, I know that's not lost on our leadership, um, but we have to show action. We have to, 
I, and I'll say this, there's this huge opportunity, David, to call Trudeau out on his hypocrisy. He hasn't delivered on most of this stuff, right? He just comes out, he's like, well, I'm a feminist. It's like, you are like, you, I think Justin Trudeau is, there's a case to be made that he is actually a detriment to women's equality in Canada with, you know, how he's treated his cabinet, how he tokenizes women, uh, the unresolved groping allegations where he's not holding himself to the same standards as uh, his caucus, um, lack of delivery on on certain types of equality issues. Like it's just, you could go through that and saying like a hypocrite is actually a detriment. So we could put that out there and marry it with like legitimate action for these communities and just be like, this is a problem. Here's how we're dealing with it. And Trudeau has had six years and all he's shown is hypocrisy. So, I mean, giddy up. I would love to do that. Like, I would love, like, let's go, you know? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. How would you feel if, no, how would you feel if the upcoming budget had a whack of money in it for a national child care program? Well, I think, okay, so first of all, we have to address child care. I think, though, what, what, where I would provide some alternate political thought is that, and first of all, I'll state, like, I'm a stepmother. Um, I haven't had biological kids, but I think that like the, the, the debate, like restricting childcare to debate of state run spaces only kind of misses the boat. So as much as I just said, we need flexibility in programming for like aging, like, like, like seniors in long-term care, the same has to go for childcare, which is a huge, it was one of the largest barriers to equality of opportunity for women. So, you know, how are we supporting women who decide to stay at home uh, to, or, 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 or run a home-based business to, to provide for childcare? You know, just looking at state daycare is not going to do that. Um, what about um, women who have family members who, or who, who choose to help uh, provide care. How are we valuing their labor? How are we valuing, um, like, 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 like? Yes, childcare spaces are part of it, but you know, how does that help gig economy workers, shift workers, workers in rural Canada? Like, like these are issues that, like. I think the Liberal Party's weakness that we can capitalize on is the Liberal Party has been so prescriptive on this, and they failed to deliver. They spent what was it? You guys spent like a couple billion dollars putting a national child care program together like 30 years ago and it delivered zero spaces. So I, I think we just need to be more creative. Investment, yes, for sure. Wait a second. I, Wait a second. We put together $2 billion for a national child care program and then you fucking defeated us is what happened. I think you guys delivered zero spaces. <laughs> well, we did because we were defeated. If you As would we like were to doing give me it. two billion dollars to do nothing, I will also take it. But I will not be sitting here <laughs> having a podcast with you at that point. So. Don't don't blame me. Blame Jack Layton. <laughs> right, it's Jack's fault. <laughs> Here's to Jack. May he rest in peace. It was a good egg. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So, do you think the party came out of the convention better than it went into it? Ah. Oh. Um, I think Aaron delivered a really good speech. Uh, I think we, uh, you know, I, I, who, who, I, I didn't know what was going to happen with a virtual convention. Um, so I think, you know, from that perspective, getting. Must have sucked. Yeah. Like, cause I mean, but everything about COVID sucks. Let's just be honest. Yeah. But I mean, like yeah. if, if Trudeau does trigger an election in the next month, you want to have your, your activists and your core volunteers kind of like enthused. And I, I'm glad that we did something. Um, so, so I would say from that perspective, yes. Um, I, I, and that's something that, you know, like the average person wouldn't see, like, I know my team was, was really excited to participate and, but yeah, it's like you, you do miss, you miss the interaction more importantly with other parts of the country. Right. Um, so, but I, I thought he gave a good speech. I really did. I was like, okay, this is good. Um, and it was like, I think one of the first times in a while that the media has kind of looked at him. So right. I, I, it, it's a place to start. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it, it, he had this, he had this great like part of his speech where he's like, climate change is real. We're going to have a plan to address this. And then, you know, that resolution was torqued. So that was unfortunate, but I, I do. 
it was all right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, I, I've eaten up a lot of your time. Can I ask you to close on this thought? What is a pos- what is a positive change that Canadians should expect if the government was to be replaced by the Conservatives? I think the Conservatives, and what I found when I, you know, as being part of the party, is that the Conservative Party legitimately cares about bringing equality and bringing opportunity to every person in this country it doesn't matter like the person who doesn't have a lobbyist has a voice in our movement and that's you know going back to the front end of this conversation that's what attracted me to the party as a young woman that's what i've always felt like it's how i try to comport myself as a politician is like for every one lobbyist meeting i'm going to take i'm going to you know meet with or, or take a hundred phone calls from people in the community and um, I also think that like we are a messy, like we're messy in terms of how we develop policy. We don't have homogeny in our caucus. And, you know, when you have a, a culture in which you actually can do like, like actually spar over, is this, this, is this a good thing? I think that leads to better public policy. Um, and, and so I, I would say that for like the average person, you've got a political entity that is committed to, to, to doing that. Um, so, so I would just say that like at a time when our country is, is, is looking at how we move forward through what I would characterize as a collective trauma, uh, you know, when, when we're spending money, there's going to be value attached to it. Um, when we are putting policy in place, it is designed to advance the interests of, again, a Canadian who doesn't have a lobbyist working for them. That's that's how I've comported myself. And, and I would just say this, uh, I am strongly and firmly committed to the rights of women and to the rights of the LGBTQ community, like every marginalized Canadian. Um, and I, 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 I think it's hard to argue that Trudeau, Trudeau's done a lot of lip service, but has he actually done a lot of messy grinding to address those issues? I would say the answer is no. And where you look at like on the farther left with the NDP, the NDP sees the answer as the state to that for everything. Whereas we would say, well, what about community organizations? You know, is there a better way? So um, I would say, you know, what I want to offer when I go to the door in whenever the election is to my constituents is hope um, and a fighter and a champion. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I would say we offer. And that's what, well, that's what I'm working for anyway. But on those issues, Michelle, for every you, there's a Sam Oosterhoff. And so how can people know who's going to prevail inside the party? Well, I mean, for, for every um, Jody Wilson Raybould, there's the five guys sitting as independents in the liberal party because of various issues, or there's a Trudeau, right? I just, I, I'm not going to cede moral high ground to Justin Trudeau by, by, you know, saying that like there's, there's shitty people and I'm not saying Sam is, but there's people who, who don't come to politics with the best of intentions in every party. It's who's the strongest voice. And, um, you know, arguably Trudeau has not silenced those voices in his caucus. And I'm not saying like, like, I'm not saying that voices need to be silenced either like just based on political philosophy. Um, I think it's like, like, like you're making the assumption that Sam doesn't care about his constituents. And I would say that's false, but would Sam and I differ on some social issues? Sure. Um, so I guess like, I just, I hate looking at politics from this like caricaturized version of how everybody should be and have certain political drog- dogma. It's on the body of work. Are you representing your community in a just and equitable way? And that's how I would want to be managed. And I would say many of my colleagues that I work with in the party feel that way. And if they don't, well, they have to deal with me and others. So. Excellent. Thank you th- so much for taking the time and being so candid. It was a great conversation. Lots of laughs and fun. I like Thanks that. for having me. Thanks for doing it. Maybe come back. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I that. Okay. We've got a caucus meeting, so I should hop on. So enjoy your political panel. Have fun. And thanks for having us.
So, I'm going to talk for a minute here about safety. And I know just saying that might cause your attention to drift. But think about it this way. It's a lot more constructive to talk about safety than to talk in hindsight about how deaths and injuries could have been prevented. At our sponsor, CN, safety is a core value. What that means is that it is simply non-negotiable. CN has a rule that every single meeting or work assignment has to start with a discussion of safety and best safety practices are the prime directive for its railroaders. You can see why. Trains are enormous and powerful and pretty much everything else is fragile by comparison. Actually, farming is a bit like railroading. They're both outdoor activities and they both involve heavy equipment and they have a common enemy, complacency, which ironically is bred by experience. The remedy is vigilance and talking about safety constantly. That's why CN is such an enthusiastic financial partner in Agriculture Safety Week, which just wrapped up. Farmers and railroaders are essential and we need them healthy and productive. Oh, and I'll repeat something I've said many times here before. For heaven's sake, be careful around railroad tracks. They aren't snowmobile trails. Obey the signs and signals. And don't even think about racing a train to get across. The train will always win. All right, panelists, we are a day late. Uh, probably a dollar short, but definitely a day late. Jenny, <laughs> we're here with the man from Snowy River. Scott was unable to make it today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're looking very hipsterish. Like you need to go and get that like a fifty dollar beard wax or something and and start uh, using it. I'm just it's a, I'm, little, it's a little bit unruly looking. Uh, I've given what up. What are you going uh, for? What are you going for? Nothing. I've just quit. I've quit grooming. I've quit grooming. You guys should. Uh, I I I smell like a bicycle seat. You should uh, if you think I look <laughs> weird. Uh, like. I just have, you know, I've said, fuck it. Until until Doug Ford opens up the economy completely and we're in a world where it's safe to go and get your hair cut and the woman who's cut my hair forever can cut my hair, um, I'm not I'm not cutting the damn thing. And so it gets weirder and it my hair grows up and it gets curly. And, uh, and I know, I know what you're thinking, David. I know you're thinking that I look like Andy Gibb and I know you're thinking that I can... Um, unleash shadow dancing, but, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, I just let it go. And the beard, I don't know. I just, the beard is, the beard's in solidarity with the hair. The beard just said, don't stop trimming me. I want to like, I want to sh show uh, props to my friend, the hair. And so uh, the whole thing is just, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen deodorant. I don't know how long, like I've just given up. So. so this is, yeah. So this is the look of, I, 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 I got nothing. I can't, I give up. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'm going for, I you got know, Early 1982 uh, kind of thing. Should we call social services about your kids? <laughs> They're fine. They're fine. I left some peanut butter <laughs> on the counter. <laughs> They'll get by. They know, they know the Netflix account password. Like, I think they're clear sailing. Is that a Paul Martin bobblehead behind you? Where'd you get a Paul Martin bobblehead? It is not a Paul Martin bobblehead. You know what this is? I will show you what this mm. is. This actually is resonant this week. This is a Mayor Rob Ford bobblehead. Remember oh, when wow. they handed out the Mayor Rob Ford bobbleheads? And uh, yeah, it's number 459 of uh, 1,000. Um, oh, it's a, think... numbered, it's, a numbered, it's a numbered piece. Yeah, this was a, a genuine oh. collector's item. And he, of course, passed away mm. five years ago this past week. Um, mm. but, uh, but yeah, that's been sitting on my mantle for years. I think... I think it was given to me by one of his former staffers. I think it was given to me by Earl Provo, who we know well, David. Who's now the, what? The agent general in Chicago? He is. Actually, that head He's, could be Earl Provo. You look at it. I've actually seen an Earl Provo bobblehead. You're kidding. Who would have made such a thing? Earl, you know, I Scott think. Reed. You know, Scott <laughs> Reed. I've got 11 inches of reinforced steel that says you're wrong. Um... <laughs> Well, well, I have the only bobblehead I own is a Menachem Begin bobblehead, and uh, he's of course the founder of the Likud Party, which is very, which is also very fitting for today because of course Israel had their election last night, like yesterday. Wow, Menachem Begin, that is yeah. going back there. I in grade six. Is your is your boyfriend going to stay in power? My boy. I want that guy out of there. I want that guy oh, out of there. BB. Uh, BB. I, I said he's got a sexy voice. He he really really does. 
Um, you said more than that. You said more than that. <laughs> you started like, you were panting. You went like, it was like, oh my God, we just turned the camera off. Um, no, it's, well, it's, it's true. So he is, based on the numbers, uh, based on the numbers I looked at this morning when I got up, um, uh, it looks like Likud is down to 30 seats, which is down six. Um, if it, and there's, st- there's still 13% of the vote to uh, uh, vote to count. So uh, BB's coalition is going to have to depend on, uh, of course, the ultra orthodox uh, United J- Jewish Torah Party and and uh, and others. Um, uh, it's going to have to continue to uh, um, uh, depend on that. But but he has uh, he has gone down in uh, in seats as of uh, as of as I said the last time I looked this morning. So it'll be interesting to see. It'll be it'll be weeks of uh, attempted coalition uh, coalition making. And of course, the center uh, the center left and the labor and. Uh, Israel Betanow and, and and those parties can uh, can take a kick at the can as well. So it'll be interesting. He's down in seats, but he's 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 up quite a bit in uh, pending criminal charges, though. So that's uh, <laughs> that helps, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> how is this guy not in jail? Hasn't he been under arrest since like two thousand? Like it's unbelievable. <laughs> okay, so folks, we got. A lot to talk about. We could be talking about the Ontario budget that's today. Woo. Today's Ontario budget. Day. Anybody got an the, insight uh, about... What's the name of the Ontario treasurer again, Jenny? Peter? Peter Bethenthalvey. But not Bethen. Bethenthalvey. 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 For Peter. people who are wondering, we did this for 20 minutes prior to the podcast starting. I've been yes, butchering his I name. Apologize. And now, <laughs> Jenny, who knows and is friends with him, I've got her to the point where she can't pronounce his name. <laughs> now no, she I, can't remember his name. Bethan Falvey, and I, I apologize to Peter because Scott has now fucked up the fact that I'm ever going to say your name. But on top of being a great uh, finance minister, he is also a very good diehard Habs fan. He was born and raised in Montreal. Well, I'll see now. Everybody has at least well, this one. This is a great week for the Habs. This is a great week for the Habs. They're not playing. <laughs> I'm a little worried. I'm not sure they're ever going to play again. Like, what's going on? They shut down the practice facility and they're not talking. Those are bad signs. It's like they just said, you know what? We took a good hard look at stuff and we said, uh, fuck this. <laughs> it's not working. We, yeah. we, we, we've gone to the owner's house and we're just drinking beer. <laughs> we could be talking about the fact that there's now a date for a federal budget. I know Jenny won't believe this, but there apparently is actually going to be a federal budget. Woo-hoo. And... Uh, I know, I know. Um, but we just went through a big political convention. So let's talk about that and what well, its implications is, are. I think big big is, big is kind of a weird word to describe it. It was a virtual um, big convention, I guess. C- can I ask a question, Jenny? Okay, this Jenny, a question. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna... uh, Before we even start, I want to ask a basic question. And I don't know, you may it's have... It's Bethan Falvey. Beth, okay, <laughs> right, absolutely. Abercrombie, um, Dilly Barr. Um, okay, um, did they have to have the convention? Like, I guess I, I, I know that there's a prospect of an election in the spring or the fall or at any point, but did they, and this isn't even about the substance of the convention and what went down, which we're going to get to, but just the challenges of having a policy convention, a national convention online, like, was it a, did they have the option of saying, you know what, guys, this works best when we can all gather someplace, when we can meet on the plenary floor, when we can drink in the hallways of the hospitality suites. And so we're going to kick this thing and wait, and we're going to schedule it for, you know, December uh, or next uh, February or something like that, because we want to have it in person. Did they have that option, or was it just not practically available to them? Yeah, no, I think they they, they definitely had that option. Um, I think that probably Aaron's team wanted to uh, uh, Aaron's team wanted to uh, to kind of get the convention out of the way, which I I'm sympathetic like I'm sympathetic to it. The liberals are having their convention in in two weeks. We can be talking about that in a couple weeks. So. Um, I, I think they could have put it off, but I think that, you know, if you're, if, if, if you're sitting and looking at where the world is, like who would have, who would have thought if we were having the convention about, or t- a conversation last March about the conservative policy convention, uh, a year, a year from now, uh, I, we would have even conceived that it still would have been virtual. So I think that, um, uh, it, it, I don't think it was necessarily a, uh, I don't think it was necessarily a terrible idea for, for them to, uh, to kind of get it out of the way. What was it like, Jenny? Like, I mean, I, when I go to a convention, when I go to a Liberal Party convention, I 
do not attend the constitutional sessions. I do not attend the policy sessions. I go and I hang around the convention facility meeting people that I haven't seen since the last convention or for a long time, renewing acquaintances, catching up on things, talking about politics. But all of that was gone from this convention and all you had was the shit of the convention. Can I well, just I say, Jenny, for one, just a little fact check. None of that is true. Um, David, when he goes to a convention, hangs out with the same six people that he hangs out with at every part of his life. <laughs> and he talks like he's watering the halls, greeting people like an Amway salesman. He is stuck in the bar with the same five people he's known since 1987, drinking and making certain that everyone who passes by and looks at him sort of hopefully like maybe I can catch his eye is ignored and rejected. So none of that is true. I just wanted to... Well, um, I remember okay. well, you can't I, do that at the convention either. No, well, I remember when I first joined politics, I was told uh, if you want to go to a PC convention, you go to a PC convention to get drunk, a liberal convention to get laid, and a reform convention to do policy and constitutional stuff. And uh, so, uh, I, yeah, it. it well, um, then I am a conser then I am a conservative in liberal clothing. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's right. I'm, I, yes, I. I let me tell you, I fall asleep drunk and alone. <laughs> so I guess I'm a conservative. Yeah. So it was. It was. It, it, it does. You do miss the camaraderie, and and, I, and Michelle talked about it in uh, 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 in your conversation with her. Is is there's it's it's so weird because there's been so many people um, that I was so used to seeing every couple of years from different parts of the country. And I had the benefit when I was, uh, uh, you know, I traveled with the prime minister, but I also did tr like training sessions and what have you, but it's been uh, several years. And so I saw names on, uh, you know, uh, in terms of debates and, and what have you. So, but it's, it was, it, it, there was no camaraderie. And I think that it, it was an unfortunate, uh, it was an unfortunate thing probably for Aaron and his team, because Aaron had to deliver a keynote. And, and uh, I can't imagine at how, A, it's, how organizationally it would have been challenging, but it's, it, I think we talked about it on the last pod. Like it's, it, you know, it, it, as a staffer, I'm sure you guys did it with your boss's speech. Uh, you stand at the back of the room because you want to see how people react. Like you want to see what is the applause, like what are the applause lines? What are, what is actually getting people up? Cause a lot of times you're surprised. What is triggering a standing ovation and what have you? And, and, uh, and having a convention like this, it um, uh, uh, it, it robbed him from being able to uh, uh, from uh, from that. I used to stand at the back of those rooms, and that is where no joking. At that point, I would not permit anyone to come up and speak to me. I would have a copy of the speech in my hand, and as he's speaking, I would be mouthing the words, disapproving of the intonation and <laughs> syllabic uh, emphasis that he would be employing, and just rocking back and forth, like literally with nerves. And I would always sit behind the media riser so I could watch the media and then like I would sit on the corner of it so that I could watch with my right eye, I could watch the media reacting to it with my left eye, the crowd reacting to it. And, uh, and I would like I, an obsessive lunatic staffer, I would be like just um, wired, like to the point where my back would ache while that yep. was happening. And I would just rock back and forth and listen to the speed to melt the words and say, don't, don't, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> Dip your head. Yeah. So, you know, we're a weird breed. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about his speech. I thought his speech was good. Let's. Well, that's Sorry, really an, 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 an abrupt and uh, tight comment, but let's start with Jenny. <laughs> um, I think his speech was. Top that. I think, uh, I think his speech was, uh, I think his speech was, de was decent. I think that um, it's smart to kind of go on the, um, uh, the, the five uh, priorities. They weren't five priorities, though, in the genre of, of Stephen Harper's five priorities in the uh, 2005 uh, campaign. So I think the the concern then, and I know we're going to get into the policy. I think the the uh, I think that there's still a lot of uh, things that need to be fleshed out in terms of policy and and uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of direction for where he's taking the party. And we saw it we saw it in terms of the policy and constitutional uh, sessions, mostly policy uh, sessions. Uh, I that, that, that there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, I, I'm not sure how flushed 
out that Aaron has uh, has thought about what the next uh, what what the next steps are. So I think the speech was decent. It wasn't a listen. It wasn't a barn burner of a of a of a speech. Uh, you know, like I I still remember lines from uh, Preston Manning's speeches and conventions uh, back in the late nineties. Uh, I remember holding a flag for an hour and a half. That was a um, uh, that was quite the speech he gave in London, and and uh, talking about salmon swimming upstream in in the Vancouver Convention in 1996. So I don't think it was that, but I think that um, I think it was uh, I think it was a decent speech. An hour and so a I half. Was, <clears throat> yeah, that's yeah, not a barn <laughs> burner. That's a barn building. That's a barn raising. That's, uh, that's too long. <laughs> Scott, before you jump in, I was going to say, I, I mean. I thought it was an interesting speech. I thought, first of all, I thought it was good speech too. Uh, and I thought it was interesting. And here's a few of the things I found interesting about it. Because uh, it really did, I think, lay out where he wants to fight this election and on what terms he wants to fight the election. So first of all, I was interested in the, in the repetitive use of the word secure or security. And I don't think that's accidental. In my, in my experience, people are always looking for some combination out of government and out of life of security and opportunity. And depending on the circumstances, people can veer more toward one or the other. And But it's always that mix, security and opportunity. And so I think by the consistent reference to security, he has concluded that in the short term coming out of this pandemic, People are going to be looking for that more than they're going to be looking for Brave New World. That follows up with his clear about the budget that if it has a lot of, uh, if it has any build back better in it, that that's going to be characterized as liberal Trudeau adventurism and risky um, as opposed to safe and secure. The third thing was the on climate. He made it clear that they're not going to stand and fight on climate change in the way that Sheer appeared to, and that he's going to have a plan that he is going to be able to portray as credible, but they are going to stand and fight on the carbon tax. And, <clears throat> and so that is a line of demarcation. They're going to try to make it not climate change, but the carbon tax. That is the dividing line. And the last and perhaps most interesting thing when people talk about where they're going to get new voters and how they're going to expand their coalition, people almost invariably talk about the 905 and the urban centers. But he went to rural Quebec. And what he said in French was the most open-ended invitation to Quebec nationalism separatism that I've heard maybe since Mulroney 84, but even that was more Levesque saying that than it was Mulroney uh, saying that. Um, I mean, he, he essentially said, if you're a separatist, if you're a hard nationalist, we're your party. The bloc can't do anything for you. We agree about untied funding. We're not going to put conditionality on things. We have, see the Federation the same way you do, and you have a home in the Conservative Party. Now, that is... Um, that's an avenue. That's a that's a possible Quebec strategy. So whether they turn out any of them or not, I saw strategy throughout the speech, and I thought it was strategy that made sense to me. When we think of Canada and space missions, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For a lot of you, I'm betting it's the Canada arm. Remember the photos? The red maple leaf against that vast sea of blackness? Well, there's a hell of a lot more to the story. It starts in 1969 with a wholly owned Canadian company called McDonald, Detweiler & Associates, now known as MDA. Theirs is a 51-year history as an international space mission partner and a robotics, satellite systems, and geo-intelligence pioneer. Like any leader, it's a story of firsts. Canada is the first country with a domestic communications satellite in orbit because of MDA's contributions. They beat NASA engineers in the race to process the first image from CSAT, the world's first radar remote sensing satellite. The Hubble Space Telescope? Canada Arm deployed it. MDA launched the world's first commercially focused radar satellite. They built a meteorological station on Mars, invented Dexter, a dual-armed robot for the International Space Station, 
an MDA has just been tapped for the third generation Canada arm for a lunar orbiting space station. I just cherry picked a few out of over 50 firsts. Now they're leading the charge toward viable moon colonies, enhanced Earth observation, and communication in a hyper connected world. MDA isn't just Canada's largest space technology developer and manufacturer. They grow our economy and they advocate for an entire industry. A space company with a big Canadian flag on their backpack. You can find out more about them at www.mda.space. Um, so to that, I'll just add a couple of things. First of all, the reason I think it was a good speech um, was because I think the first set of challenges that he had to confront were internal challenges, which you know, take us in a minute to what happened the day after. But I think that, you know, I've listened to you, Jenny, on this pod and in conversation, right? And I've heard you say, you know, in, a, in effect, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've heard you say, do not fucking go with the carbon tax. Do not go there. And I thought that on that critical challenge, he developed kind of what I think I've heard David recommend in the past, right? Which is the correct formula here is to say, I will oppose a carbon tax, but I present a more credible, more rigorous climate plan than we as a party have presented in the recent past. And um, and I think, uh, I think that was smart politically. I thought that probably struck the appropriate balance at minimum to manage internal party intramural um, challenges, but I think it might be a good uh, positioning for the um, uh, for the broad electorate, or at least a possible one. Um, I was struck, uh, just picking up on David's point, I was struck by the way that he tried to characterize himself as a political offering. So David talked about security and opportunity. I think the use of secure and security over and over again was as much about trying to brand himself. I think that he's trying to present himself as, I'm a safe hands kind of guy. I'm a sensible, common sense, um, suburban, uh, backyard fence kind of guy. Uh, and you can trust me to manage things uh, capably. So I think that, yeah, he was, he was trying to... Um, trying to pick up on where he thinks the country was at, but I also think he was trying to communicate to the country. Uh, I'm that guy. I'm, a, I'm, 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 and modern conservatism doesn't have to be about, you know, just fiscal probity because we're, we're going to take 10 years to balance the budget. Um, it doesn't have to be about some kind of like, you know, return to traditional values. I'm going to define conservatism and myself as, you know what, let's just get the shit done. Let's just be like unflashy, um, workmanlike, uh, common sense, secure government. And I think in that respect, and let's come to the climate change thing in a minute, but I, cause, and since I know we will, I'll leave it for now. Um, but on that issue, I, I, the jury's out. I thought that he was, all, I thought it was all skillful. So I thought it was coherent and skillful, but the jury's out in my mind uh, about whether or not that's a winning prescription. Because I, I think the world's going to open up and we're going to see 7, 8, 9% GDP growth. I think the squillions and squillions of dollars the United States is going to spend is going to cost, uh, is going to create uh, a lift um, that will spill over our borders. I think that whatever we add to this, and we'll add, I'm sure, handsomely to it uh, on April 19th through Freeland's budget, will create a lift. And, and I wonder if there's going to be this burst of... Uh, so people won't be in that headspace. And then secondly, I'm not sure he's established himself as this. Like, I think that his self-image is, I'm this like tough, decent guy that everybody recognizes as, you know, um, safe, secure, sensible. I don't think that people know who he is in the slightest. And so I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that he's describing values to himself that people recognize. Um, you know, I, I was joking with you, like he keeps talking about this, like he, he positions himself as like, you know, this former military guy, safe, sensible. I, I, people don't know that. And so I, I'm not so sure uh, that the secure thing is, um, I, I think, and somebody else wrote a column like this, I think, I, I think he could find himself six months from now selling a message that feels 12 months old. 
Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I, I would I would go as far, though, as saying I'm not sure even if people uh, uh, people do know that about him. And I think that part of the problem he's he has is if you look at the polls, uh, he is either unknown. And the more that people get to know him, the more uh, he rubs them the wrong way. I'm not sure they care. I'm not sure that. Uh, a good strategy for the conservatives is to run a campaign where they're putting up O'Toole versus Trudeau. I just don't think that, I don't think that you're, I think, I don't think you're going to win that. And we know that there are campaigns that we've both run and been on both sides where you have to like make the decision that you're, you're going to put the party brand focus ahead of the, uh, uh, ahead of the leader. If, if you remember for all of 04 and most of the 05, 06 campaign, uh, it, you know, it, we weren't putting up Stephen Harper versus Paul Martin. That changed in subsequent elections, but it was, we talked a lot about the Conservative Party. And so uh, I think that if you're the Conservatives, you have to, it's, it's, you know, you have to make the, what decision is best for us in terms of messaging. And I think that the continued trying to put leaders up against uh, Trudeau, I think it's going to, uh, I think it's going to fail uh, on, uh, uh, fail for them. I was taking notes, Scott, while you were uh, while you were speaking, but I was so so that's that's kind of the one the one thing I would say there. Also, in terms of uh, obviously, secure is uh, is definitely something that they've decided is going to be their focus. It'll probably be in their platform. It'll probably be in all their messaging. But I think this is what they need to flesh out because if you had like you had you know securing mental health uh, for Canadians during the pandemic, I think that's an extremely good policy. And the next one is securing. Securing Canada, I think it was there. Secure the secure the country. But what he what he went to talk about in a speech uh, was then about securing PPE, which just seemed like not a it, it 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 was kind of bit weird because when you think of secure Canada, you're thinking keeping Canadians safe, um, military, and what have you. And so I think this is where they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to flush these policies out because I think that it's it's um, I I think Scott to your point, I think there's going to be a lot of substantive. Uh, stuff in uh, uh, in the budget coming up. Uh, I think the Liberals are going to make this a, a, a values a values budget, our values versus theirs, and uh, the Conservatives uh, in the next three weeks uh, leading into the budget, if it's leading into an election, uh, need to figure out what their value proposition is and what policies then they're going to uh, what they're going to campaign on. Is there juice in the military guy as a leader thing? Like uh, you know, it's it like. When was it, the last? When was the last? Cons- well, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, is who is he? Canadian George Hees, right? It, I, you know, so. Um, but it I feels like there's an overt effort to do that, right? Like you know, as you say. The use well, wait of a word- second. It's unabashedly positive. It is unabashedly positive as a bio. It tells people of a course. lot about of course. a person but David, that they the were last- in the military. It tells them that they believe in public service. It tells you that the person has discipline. It tells you that the person has physical rigor. It tells you a bunch of things. And David, w- David, when was the last time someone with a military background was elected prime minister in Canada? I, I don't believe ever. I just, I, I agree with everything you just said, David, but it feels like, and maybe I'm misreading it, but it feels like the... The word secure, security, it does provoke that attachment, right? And it, and again, it goes back to my thought that they're trying to sell and define him. So it feels like they're trying to draw from that um, that history, uh, his personal history. And I, I just, I don't know. I don't know if it, I, I mean, I think that people look at it in a positive way, but I don't know that it's... Um, I don't know that it's the political winner that they seem to be trying to establish it as. I agree with Scott. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's great. I think his service in the military is uh, uh, is something that definitely they should they should talk about. But I think that if the conservatives think that it's kind of a silver bullet, a silver bullet, so to speak, I just don't think. Can I, I think if you look at um, uh, if you look at who Canadians have elected uh, historically. Um, they haven't elected uh, military leaders. It's not like the it's not like the U.S. Like it's hard to name. It's easier to name president, former presidents that don't have uh, military service than it is ones that do. Right. Is he getting into a seriousness battle with Trudeau? Is that part of it? Does he want to be seen as a more serious person? But I don't think that Matt. I think listen. I think that Trudeau. This is kind of like campaigning on Trudeau. It's the same thing as saying. Um, he's just not ready. He's been prime minister for over like for close to six years now. Like he's he's been elected. Uh, uh, he's been elected twice. So I, I think going into a serious like I, I just don't think it's a credible argument to to make. He, it's it, it, it's kind of a waste because Canadians have seen him for six years uh, uh, as as leader of the country. So obviously they think he's he's serious enough to be prime minister because they have elected him twice. The, the- right. The line between serious and sullen is 
you know, can be dangerously thin. And I think when it comes to political branding and leadership branding, um, you got to be very careful about that. I think that the, you know, the Conservative Party, you know, runs a real risk already of looking like it's too dour, that it looks like it's, uh, um, you know, a kind of a national scold. And 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 it, it seems like they lose their perspective around the Trudeau thing. So I think, you know, I like, I think it's smart to say, you know what, if they start social engineering and throwing billions and billions of dollars on, you know, sort of small L liberal projects, and that's a mistake. But positioning, um, positioning O'Toole himself, positioning the party writ large as we're going to be the serious adults in the room. I think that's a real risk. I think that's where they're, I think that reveals myopia. I think it's like, oh, people must still fundamentally agree with us that Trudeau is not a serious dude, that he's not to be taken seriously, and they're just waiting for the proper adult to show up and to take control of things. And that's, that's, that's a fundamental misdiagnosis. People are, you know, there's lots to criticize about Trudeau, but I think people have made it clear with their votes um, that they're entirely comfortable with the guy and, and they don't start from that point of departure. So, David, to go back, you had mentioned uh, you had mentioned that um, uh, appealing to Quebec separatists. You think that's you think that's a, a good strategy for him because because I'll be honest, I heard from people in the West, um, uh, people from Alberta that were uh, were somewhat annoyed that really the only time he talked about the West was in terms of talking about Wexit. And I think that um, I think that there is a real uh, movement. I have heard from several people that uh, over the last couple months uh, that uh, the Maverick Party uh, and whether it stays the Maverick Party after an election or what have you have been raising money hand over fist uh, uh, in, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so um, if that's the case, I really think that that uh, uh, I really think that uh, Aaron then has uh, he has the added challenge. It's 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 yes, you need to pick up uh, more voters. But I, I had a friend uh, say to me uh, on the weekend, their comment was this is feeling like 1989, 1990 all over again. Fuck, you know, God, you guys have built such a difficult party for people to lead like, man, just that. I mean, it, that it's all entirely legitimate point that you make, obviously. But I'd also just even the posing of the issue, I think, highlights, um, you know, what a compartmentalized coalition it is and how difficult it is. Right. Um, but Jesus. this goes back to what we've talked about. Part of the part of the issue that and, and, and I know I've, I've I've said this repeatedly and I say it publicly as and privately, uh, obviously, as well. Um, part of the issue that Aaron has is he ran on he ran on a complete opposite um, uh platform uh, than what he's governing on. And, and, you know, I had, I had a friend text me this morning um, and say, you know, everyone kind of expects people uh, to, to kind of maybe veer more to the center and what have you, but like, this has been a, like a complete, yeah. like a complete reversal. And, and that's part of the problem um, that he has with, with members. It's not so much of even what he's saying. He's the problem is, is what he's saying is opposite in a lot of cases than what he, um, uh, than what he, um, than what he campaigned on. Yeah. And so I think the problem he, he will yeah. now have to is we need to see as a party what policies are fleshed out, because I don't think that they ended the convention um, uh, any. I don't think they ended internally the convention any better than than, you know, what they started it at. Well, fuck worse. I mean, can, let's get to it. Come on. Let's get to this climate. Change. No, but wait, no, 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 no. We're not, I'm not done. Wait. All right. Jenny, <laughs> just just to go to what you were saying, just to go to what you were saying, they could lose. The conservatives could lose 20% of their vote in the Prairie Provinces to the Maverick Party and still win all those seats. Um, now, maybe that would bode poorly for the future, but at least in the first election, they could still win all of those seats. Now, we all know an unpleasant truth about this country, which is that it is divided and that people in Ontario and Quebec the more you sound like you're concerned about Alberta and you're the Conservative Party, the less you sound like you're concerned about Ontario and Quebec. The more alienating you sound to those two provinces. And if I was running the Conservative campaign, wouldn't I just have to assume that I've got those prairie seats in the bank and not spend an iota of capital trying to reinforce them and focus every tool I have on winning more seats in Ontario and Quebec. But but this is what I don't get with that argument. It's not like here, um, Michelle Rempel has 15,000 vote chits and she'll just, you know, uh, she doesn't need those 15,000 votes. So she'll just, 
she'll just send it over to Ontario and those votes will magically appear. It just doesn't happen that way. That is not how campaigns are run. Why, why can't a party, uh, why can't a party uh, uh, keep the current votes that they have and just try to get more with better policies? Like this argument that you have to like, you know, fuck some voters over uh, to, to win to win another uh, to another province. I've never subscribed to. And, and I think that over, you know, the nine and a half, tw 10 years that Stephen Harper was prime minister, I think we proved that that's not the case. You don't have to fuck Alberta to win seats in Ontario. You don't have to fuck Alberta for sure. You don't. But you don't. But you you need to talk in a way that makes it sound in Ontario and Quebec like you're not the Alberta party. So that's fucking Alberta. No, you have to have policies that you have to have policies that your voter, like the the, the people that you are targeting, uh, subscribe to in all of those places. And and this whole and and if this is if 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 the if uh, if my party if Aaron and his team are subscribing to what. Um, uh, to, to what you were saying, it will have absolute long-term benefits uh, for your federal party, and uh, it will not for mine. It's a very short-sighted way of thinking. Well, I don't know. I think these trade-offs are involved in in all parties. I mean, uh, but I, I don't agree. I, I, I fundamentally, I fundamentally don't agree with that. Okay. Well, but the, a rub comes at some point. A rub comes on policy choices, as you say. I mean, you call it better policies. Well, that's a that's a phrase. Um, you know, the rub comes when you get down to how much is your policy with respect to energy going to be about um, trying to um, maintain and extend the life of the oil patch versus transit um, to a cleaner energy future. And, you know, that, that, that's where it gets really awkward, that stuff, you know. And so um, if it's the former, uh, then, you know, you're going to get Premier Legault right up your ass during a federal election campaign. Because um, you're talking about stuff like pipelines and you're talking about, um, you know, other extractive policies. And if you're talking and if you talk too quickly about transition, then, you know, quite legitimately, all those people in the oil field are going to start saying in the oil patch, and not just in Alberta, but in Saskatchewan and even in Newfoundland and other places or in BC are going to say, so you guys are just whistling past our fucking grave. Is that what you're doing? You're walking over our grave. And you're saying that we're already dead. And now it's just a question of how much to buy the tombstone. So, you know, it's when you get past the better policy label and into the what is the policy, um, it becomes tough work and tough choices are involved. Well, and this will be it's tomorrow. We'll, we'll not just tough things you things you don't like. Like I mean, just from a Liberal Party perspective, right? In terms of doing things to get electoral advantage, I mean the intellectual pretzels that the Liberal Party has contorted itself into over Quebec over the years in order to accommodate its yes. electoral prospects in Quebec. Liberals regularly accept things in Quebec that they wouldn't accept anywhere else, regularly decline to participate in debates, particularly over, over uh, rights issues yep. in Quebec that they would participate in anywhere else. And we just all have to fucking swallow that because we need those 40 seats. Just completely duck debates about rights infringements that we would not tolerate in any other part of the country if it was being covered by the Toronto Star. Absolutely happens all the time. Those are the compromises of... Um, of aspiring for that to be in your national coalition. Which is why I thought that the separatist appeal, I understand that lots of people have said for the last 60 years that conservative parties of one ilk or another, either Harper's or the PC party that preceded it, that's the pond in which they should fish for Quebec votes. Um, but, you know, show me, I, I mean, what? It's the only Harper place they've ever tense? found them, Scott. That's where Diefenbaker found them. That's where Mulroney found them. That's where Harper when found them. When yeah. we won our majority, Scott, we had five seats in Quebec. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, I think you got up to, what, 10, 12, maybe, you know, uh, those blue seats. Um, y you know, um, I guess my, my question book, is... There was a I'm, book called French Kiss about Harper in Quebec. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just wonder if, 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 if O'Toole... I mean, the other part of what you're saying, David, in those trade-offs, you also have to... You know, the X-axis is... Where have I got votes and where do I need them? The y-axis is 
how likely is that? Because that tells you the likelihood of it tells you how bold you can be and how much you can afford to take certain things for granted. So if you want to do an overt appeal to those votes in uh, in rural Quebec um, at the expense of alienating um, existing voters, you better feel pretty confident that you have a real shot at getting them. Because if you spend all that energy and alienate those other votes, but don't get the ones you're looking for, you end up in the worst of both worlds, not the best. Yeah, but you know, Scott, and and I mean, the Conservatives, ha- if you're O'Toole, you have to throw the ball down the field. You cannot run off tackle from where you are and get to uh, and get to a, a victory. You're going to have to throw the ball. But that's but I I fail to I I where I disagree is voters have different priorities in in uh, uh, in different regions. Harper did some very symbolic things that um, uh, didn't affect. Uh, voters in other regions. Quebec is a nation. One of the first things he did during the uh, 2000 yep. and, uh, in, in 2006, we also campaigned hard on scrapping the gun registry in rural Quebec and had a full French campaign on scrapping the scrapping the registry and then scrap the registry. So the voters in rural Quebec felt the exact same as rural, voters in rural Ontario, as, as Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, in British Columbia, so I think those are issues that that as a conservative, this is this is where they have to uh, where they have to go. They have to come up with a platform uh, and a, and policies that are palatable to voters across the country, both conservative voters and swing voters. And I think that what they need to do is come up with a plan. But you don't have to do it by repudiating everything. Uh, from the past, because the past, uh, the modern conservative par- party in the past has been very, um, uh, has been obviously very uh, successful. And I know that Scott, you've been wanting to get to the to the vote. So the vote on uh, the vote on hey, Saturday. Can, can, before Trump- you do that, can I just ask you a question? <laughs> honest, uh, honest. Because you just said something really significant. Do you think that O'Toole is repudiating the party of the past? Like I think that's a pretty strong allegation. And. Um, I, and I, I, I don't think, know. Maybe I, I think, like I'm not. I'm not his biggest fan, but I didn't really. I didn't hear that. Like I think there's that, a lot of there's. I think there's a lot of people that uh, um, are un. I, I'm not going to say uncomfortable. Uh, that don't like the kind of uh, the thought that well, this is my fa- this is my you know this isn't your father's conservative party. Well, because um, uh, because that seems to a lot of people that that's kind of a dig at at Harper and uh, I and and you know I I. I don't like that terminology as well. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, termin- terminology as well. Uh, either Harper was, as I said, prime minister in the last twenty years. He he was the longest serving prime minister we've had in that twenty years, uh, close to uh, a full uh, a full decade. And so I think that um, I don't I, I don't think that you can can uh, uh, I, I think I think the language uh, the language uh, is uh, is wrong on that. In terms of the in terms of the vote. Um, here are two things, and I look at this as a as an organizer. Obviously, Aaron wanted to talk about uh, climate change, and there's a significant part in our party's uh, policy book on climate change and uh, fighting climate change, and you know, uh, going after big emitters like the U.S. and China and what have you. So it's one of two things happened uh, with this is and either if if this was such a significant policy for uh, for for Aaron. I'm not sure why his organizers weren't um, calling people or saying this this motion is very important yeah. to the to to the leader. Uh, we would really you might not like it, uh, and it might be word worded wrongly because it was it was kind of a, 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 a it was very it was kind of ch- a chunky chunky worded uh, policy um, uh, declaration uh, policy resolution. So so I'm not sure why his organizers weren't calling around to kind of uh, rally the troops um, and. Then, if they were calling around to rally the troops, then that's almost even worse because it was kind of a uh, giant, well, go fuck yourself. Um, so I'm not sure what it was. Uh, I think maybe perhaps they were so focused on other resolutions that this one kind of slipped by and they didn't even, uh, uh, they didn't probably even come on, what was happening. come on. Well, I had that How same could question. that be the case? I had that same How question. could that I, be the case? Well, because How did the it whole even debate... come to a vote. Well, why was they managed to keep the abortion motion off the floor? Why didn't they keep this off the floor? Well, because that's what I'm saying, David. That's what I, I wonder. That, I, that, that's what I'm saying. I think that it probably slipped through because they were so focused on on uh, on on having the abortion and other resolutions uh, move down the uh, move down the channel that this one moved up and I and they probably didn't even uh, give some thought to it. But so it's it's one of the two things. It's either lack of organization, and I say this as an organizer. Um, I, who, you know, did a lot of, uh, 
uh, you know, did a lot of uh, campaigning at, of uh, at, at conventions. If in the 2005 convention, everyone talks about certain policies like, you know, youth wing versus non-youth wing and same-sex marriage, but it was stuff like supply management that we obviously wanted to support. And for our for the alliance and, and uh, reform wing of the party, that was obviously something our members, as you know, were not as supportive of. So, so there's a lot of, you know, horse trading for lack of a better term or you know we really this needs to happen and i'm not and and it must have been difficult obviously not uh being there to a certain extent but it it you know i, I think that it i think it just i think it slipped by and ended up causing uh uh causing the vast majorities of the uh of the of the stories of the weekend it, it stomped on his speech actually I, it, totally. was a, it, totally. it was now a, to what extent was the vote to what extent was the vote against it eh, fuck you to a tool in the sense that was it people who uh, like all those delegates that Sloan and his folks had elected, who weren't allowed to vote on abortion and got shut out of various things? Were they looking for the first opportunity to whack O'Toole? I don't know. I don't know. Or what does that vote mean? What does that vote mean? Like I, I know that it, most conservatives don't, don't deny the existence of climate change. So what does it mean? I uh, listen. I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I I actually don't know what it means because I don't know. I don't know whether it was just something that slipped by or whether it was a concerted effort to screw him. I actually am not, um, I'm not sure. I think that, uh, I don't think it really means, um, listen, internally, and we've talked about this before, internally, I, I think it means that um, Aaron still has challenges within the party that he has to, his, he, he and he's going to have to acknowledge because, um, you know, a decent speech and a virtual convention doesn't, doesn't change the, uh, uh, the way that uh, people are feeling. It just, there's nothing, there's nothing new for the media to uh, uh, to write about, which is why there haven't been uh, uh, stories. There has to be something, you know, news. There has to be something new in news. And so, um, I'm not sure it means anything. It'll it'll depend on on how his team uh, how his team reacts to it. And I think it'll be interesting to see how a lot of politicians. I think we've got the Supreme Court reference on uh, carbon tax tomorrow. So it's going to be a very interesting opportunity for politicians of all stripes uh, to uh, to give their uh, uh, to give their opinion on this. Look, I, I, I'll just say this because, you know, once something's discussed for two, three days, people want to get counterintuitive. They want to find like some other kernel of other insight. You're not doing that, Jenny. I'm talking about others that I've seen in the media and stuff. Um, and tell us why this isn't that big a deal and, you know, what there's more to this than meets the eye. I don't think there's anything more to this than meets the eye. I think this thing is a fucking catastrophe. I think it was an absolute catastrophe. All three of us have been involved in campaigns. All three of us have been involved in trying to manage conventions. And we know this thing was a catastrophe. There's a sort of an inside-outside dimension to these kinds of conventions. The inside is, can I bring that coalition together, understanding that I'm going to leave some people alienated, but we need to muscle our way through to some sort of position of coherence here. It's about the leader. It's about establishing some room for the leader to operate going into the next uh, convention. You know, we went through it. Uh, you know, at Hull, way back, David, in like 1992 at, at the Hull-Elmer conference, right? Um, Harper went through it in Montreal in 2005. This was supposed to be that moment for him. He told people that he was going to resolve this issue on carbon tax and climate change. He did in his speech. It had coherence. It made some sense. And then they lost the vote. And it's a fucking laughing stock issue. The coherence fall apart. So inside, that coherence isn't there. Outside, it's the number one thing that people heard about at this convention. They did not hear about his solid speech. They didn't hear about security. They didn't hear about his positioning on this issue or that they heard about this and it is an ad in the making and it is a laugh line that's been thrown out of in and parliament and so it is a full-fledged fucking catastrophe from a political standpoint i don't know if it's because they organized themselves to concentrate on the abortion thing like they might have thought they had two jobs right one is get that speech right and the second is stop the abortion resolution the pro-life stuff and they and and they let this other thing slide if so well then that's damning because obviously they let something slide over the fence that could really harm them and it did if they organized against it and lost well then that tells you that internally they got more than their hands full and it means that um that even if they come to a showdown, they can't win it. So that doesn't bode very well. So uh, inside and outside, however you measure this thing, it's a goddamn catastrophe. And O'Toole's going to tell us it doesn't matter. I'm the leader. I set the policy. Um, but it uh, it lacks coherence internally and externally. He lacks coherence now as a result of this. So I think it's a really damning event. 
Well, and I, th okay. I think, but, but, I think, if, and I'll, I'll just end this by saying, I also think that if, if uh, the the uh, Tories, if we think that we're going to take on the Liberals in terms of uh, debating climate change uh, during the election, I think we've kind of fallen into a bit of a, a bit of a trap. It's like, what is that? Yeah. Ak Akbar from uh, uh, Star Wars, like it's a trap, it's a trap. <laughs> um, uh, and so, <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> um, he's the the lobster looking man. Um, Admiral Akbar. So, yeah. Um, so I think it'll end up being a. I think it'll end up being a a, a, a mistake. I think that this is obviously a a, a sword issue for uh, for the Liberals. And also, if you look at polling numbers, and we talked about this, uh, people's naming climate change as their as their number one issue has has dropped dramatically uh, for obvious reasons over the last kind of. I, a year and a half. And so um, we'll see. This is why I think it's, I know I'll, I'll, I, I sound like a broken record and I'll, I'll, this is the last time I'll, I'll say it. This is why it's very important that in the next, uh, in the next, in the near future that Aaron O'Toole needs to flesh out uh, the subheadings of his speech and actually uh, present some solid, uh, some solid policies. Dave, do you think there's a trap here for the liberals too? Do you think there's a danger that in the zeal to um, exploit this vulnerability, they'll talk more than they should about climate change and carbon tax and see and mistake an opportunity to put one in the ribs of their opponent as an opportunity to focus overtly on the issue. Um, because I don't think they're going to get reelected on, on a carbon tax. I think they get reelected on, we've got the best plan for recovery uh, we've got the best plan going forward. We manage the pandemic competently and we're going to have the best uh, plan for the recovery and our values shape both those things. Um, and if they focus too greatly on on climate change investment and carbon tax, I think they, they might miss the, the plot. Oh, it's definitely a hand that can be overplayed. I mean, let me tell you the current state of public opinion on this, which is nobody knows anything about climate change policy including the carbon tax, or how it works, or how it's connected to a better outcome. People do not understand how the levers are connected to the outcomes of this stuff, uh, nor do people think they are the primary problem in the climate change. People continue to think that business is the primary problem, not individuals. And But people have clearly come to believe that this is serious enough that you can't be the government unless you are serious about it. If liberals think that that means that there has to be a carbon tax, they're wrong. They're wrong. I think Canadians would love to be persuaded that Canada could meet its obligations to fight to the fight against climate change without a carbon tax. And all of the mechanics of the carbon tax, the rebate, all these things are still very poorly understood. So I think O'Toole is trying to take something that has been used as a sword against them and turn it into a sword back and not have a fight about climate change. Jenny's right. If the fight's about climate change, then the conservatives are going to lose. If the fight is about competing climate change plans and one has a carbon tax and one doesn't, that's an entirely different fight altogether. I think that uh, there's, there's probably traps on here for both sides. But if liberals think the carbon tax is a settled issue that Canadians like, they're fucking wrong. Okay. That makes sense to me. So, um, so I, would bank the, I would bank the embarrassment of my opponent. I would make strategic use of it whenever I can to undermine him in a variety of broad ways. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't make the mistake of saying, let's go hard for the carbon tax guys because uh, we smell blood. It'd be our own blood we could be sniffing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, just in fairness to O'Toole, can we spend a couple of minutes on the differences between resolutions that get approved at party conventions and the platform that the party runs on in the election. Either one of you care to give us a primer on the differences between those two things or how they are related? Well, That's you, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think that there's obviously some uh, some party uh, uh, some party policies that obviously uh, kind of you know, bedrock issues, like I said, supply management. I think that's why founding conventions are very important because it's not just a policy document. it's a it's a it's a kind of a vision. 
vision uh, yeah. moving forward. But just because something's in the policy document does not mean uh, that that it's in the platform. It, it's it's it, in any of the elections that I were, was involved in, in terms of, uh, you know, watching and, and I wasn't a policy person. I was not going to I was not sitting around uh, uh, with the platform. I, I you know, I was the one that came at, I was one of the people that came in at the last moment when the when it was all done and go, well, that sucks. Or that's really good. Change that. Change this. One of those helpful, helpful people uh, that yes. came in at the end. But it, it never once were like you know the founding principles. It, it, it could be as a guideline, but but we were not. Just because something passes at a policy conference does not mean that um, the uh, uh, party is going to campaign on it. For sure, it, exactly right. They're strategic documents. They're designed by back rumors. Uh, you know, actually, there's quite. This might be interesting. There's quite a difference, Scott. Talk a little bit about this. There's quite a difference between how parties in opposition do this and parties in government do platforms. The huge difference because the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy is involved in the governmental platform, right? They never were for ours. Well, <laughs> they're involved in the sense that the program that you eventually incorporate into your platform is obviously based upon the program you're executing in government through, uh, which is you know, being. Uh, enabled by the um by the public service i mean i i think in in government um in in government i would argue in government policy platforms tend to play a less significant role um i'm not sure that's always wise uh, i think that a lot of times governments um fall into the trap of running on their record as opposed to running on their next plan i think there's lots of governments that would be well served by saying you know what we're going to talk about the four things that are going to really define what we want to accomplish going forward in these next number of years. And, 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 and without even all that much reference to their existing record, just taking it for granted. But that's not generally what happens. And when you're in opposition, you almost always use the policy document fundamentally as a strategic and a communications tool. One, you use it to unite the party and to identify what kind of broad voter coalition you want publicly. And so you that's why I said earlier, it's an inside outside play. It's about coherence. Um, it's about making sense. And so you decide what the territory is you want to fight on. Um, do you seem coherent and consistent? Uh, all those things come out of a platform. And you know sometimes that takes you to a really detailed platform. Um, like it did in 1993 with the Red Book, because the the knock on Chrétien was, this is a guy who doesn't have policy. This guy who isn't about anything. Okay, well then let's be more substantive. Sometimes it's um, about five priorities. Uh, there aren't even like fully realized policies. They're just five priorities like Harper did in 2006. And that made a lot of sense because it gave people a sense of anchor. Um, and, you know, so in, in opposition, I think they're much more about defining your strategic offering and in government, they're they in government they platforms tend to be less significant and um, and I think less um, uh, less utilized. Uh, I think that you know it's a I think it's a it's a, an opportunity that governments overlook when they're running for re-election. Yeah, I agree. Our right. platforms when we were in government, um, uh, they were what what drove. They were almost more um, of a document for like our scripting team. So the team that that does the uh, for I, I say that I, so for 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 your scripting team is you know the people that hold the pen on the speech, the press releases, the talking points, uh, and usually for us one person like you would be assigned an event, and so it's it's a document for uh, uh, for scripters uh, to use. But there were times there was one campaign where I think we looked at each other and said, "Have we even released the full platform yet? We should really get that out." Like it's it's not like the events that 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 it was like. And and I I'm I I found over the last few elections they it's meant even less like platform day in the first few convention or first first few elections that I was part of like that was a big fucking day it was like budget day like it was a it was a big fucking day people prepared for it you practiced for it uh, it was almost like getting ready for like it's it was almost like prepping like your policy people yeah. you were prepping like you would a leader like the leader for the leaders debates. Do you remember ninety seven uh, Jenny Manning? You guys got a hold of our platform. Yeah, the government platform and we we're running for re-election and I was I was in uh, headquarters. I wasn't on the plane. I was in headquarters working in the Kretchen campaign and, and the re-election campaign. And to your point, like news that Manning had our platform and was going to release it. It was a fucking thunderbolt. Like it was a gigantic event. It 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 it, it ripped through the building. And we were like, oh, my God, like we went into like it was like an episode of Star Trek where suddenly the ship tilted and we're all going like, Scotty, <laughs> Scotty, I got to get more power redirect from shields. Right. We went into drills and, uh, you know, it was 
uh, as you say, they've they've become less consequential. But I don't know that they have to be less consequential. I think that, you know, depending cir- political circumstances for a particular campaign, opposition party in particular, you know, those circumstances might conspire to make a platform day really, really, really important to somebody again yeah. in the future. I don't know. Goodbye, I think Trudeau's, pro- Goodbye, I think Trudeau's promise to run a deficit. I think Trudeau's promise to run a deficit in 2015 put the knife into Mulcair. Yeah, for sure. That's a good point. It yeah. absolutely did. I remember, so 97 was my first big election and I was traveling around on the Reform Youth bus and I remember that because Manning, his, his, he held it up and he was like, goodbye, red book, hello, checkbook. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to say that every party gets weird resolutions out of their conventions sure they that, they, that they ignore. I grew up in Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan NDP used to gather in convention every year and demand an end to uranium mining. And every year, the Blakeney government would say, fuck off. We make a lot of money mining uranium, and we're going to keep doing it. And um, and as a young liberal, when I still went to the policy parts of the convention and took them seriously, I, you know, in the, in the, in the first Trudeau, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's government, Christ, you could barely get a resolution passed before some guy like Jean-Luc Pepin would be running to a mic to tell you how little he gave a shit about what the party <laughs> thought about any. Um, so uh, <laughs> this is this is not an isolated occurrence. You, you, you're you're right. going on. Parties, so t- let me just add, uh, you're right. All parties pass resolutions that are kooky and stuff, right? The, the, the difference is that you do still use policy conventions and platforms to to try to organize a moment and to, and, and, and to, and, and to resolve a couple of things and the, you can have a kooky uh embarrassing uh policy resolution pass but what you can't have is have that kooky policy resolution be something that the leader and the leader's people in advance of the convention have told you is fundamental to their ambitions for the weekend so you can't say on right. friday night he's going to tell you what he's got to say on carbon tax and climate and then on Saturday, have that position repudiated. Like the that that isn't just the goofy. That isn't a uranium uh, resolution. That's that that's a no. that's a bullet uh, aimed at the temple. And by the way, that isn't O'Toole's fault. That's a staff job. Staff fucked that up. And I have a little sympathy for them because my guess is they were told, "Man, you know what? Like that, we're going to slay that dragon on its own." But this. We got our hands full with this political battle over over uh, the lifers, and you know, there's probably they're thinking to themselves, "Jesus, we've pulled off a success here. It looks like we're going to wrestle that thing to the mat." And then they wake up and go, "Uh oh, we we left this unattended." That's I my guess not, as to what it happened. Would, it would not have been a fun meeting. Like if I if I if it was one of those things that happened when. Uh, 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 when I was uh, working for Harper, it wouldn't have been a fun, like if it was virtual, it would have been that phone call where you like, you call the switchboard and you're like, oh, have, don't have him answer the phone. Don't have him answer the phone. <laughs> I remember those calls. Switchboard, you see that 4211 come up on the thing, you'd be like, oh, Jesus Christ, can I tell him I'm not here? He's the prime minister with God. I don't want to answer. I don't want to answer. He's going to just Ms., Ms., take an Ms. ashtray and beat my fucking head in. Oh, I used to, it'd be Ms. Burr? Yes. It's the Prime Minister switchboard. Yes. Huh. I've got the Prime Minister on the phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, Jenny, you got a hey you? Oh, fuck. I don't know. My hey you, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to keep the hey you light, light, lighthearted hearted and out of politics, but my hey you is to the Montreal Canadiens. Their entire organization from the owners to the management to the players. What the fuck is going on? I, I, I have no other, like, I, that is just a question I want to know. They, there, there seems like, I know sometimes it, 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 in all facets of life, when things start to go bad, it seems to be like a tumbleweed and it just keeps getting worse and worse. But I don't know, like, what, like, I don't know what the hell any of them are, are doing, but uh, whatever it is, it's, it's not in any way good. So my hate you is to the Habs. Please, you're killing me. Get your shit together. My hate you is a little bit more serious, although I endorse that, hey you. Um, My hey you goes out to Bill Blair, the Minister of Public Safety. We learned this past week that when the RCMP went to Colton Bushy's home to tell his mother that he had been murdered, that they accused her of being drunk, 
They told her to get her shit together. They searched her house. When she told them that she had been expecting Colton home and had his food in the microwave, they said, I don't believe you, and they went to check. Um, this is a race. This is a, a police force that obviously has racism deeply, deeply embedded in it. It is entirely unreasonable to ask indigenous people to be policed by a group of people who evidently hate their guts. And so you have to make some change. And uh, the commissioner was supposed to bring change. That isn't happening. This is a morally bankrupt organization that needs to get fixed, and it's your job to fix it, Bill Blair. Wow. Okay. Well, I... I actually uh, echo both those, uh, the um, uh, the more lighthearted one of uh, Jenny's and the decidedly unlighthearted uh, hey you of, um, of David's. I'm going to switch back uh, to a far less serious uh, matter. My hey you goes to Warner Brothers. My hey you <laughs> is that, you know, uh, I sat through the Snyder, the, the Snyder Cut 2.5 times this past weekend, which is roughly 12 hours. 10 hours. And, 10 yeah, hours, right? Well, it felt like that at least. And felt like 30 hours. And here's the thing, man. Okay. The theatrical release, the Whedon Cut, it sucked. It made no sense. It was so cut up and incoherent. It was terrible. And then the Snyder Cut... It was much better, but it was so bloated and big. Why can't you people, why can't you people take an edit suite and build a 2.5 hour film that's perfect? I don't understand. You've got Superman, you got Batman, you got Wonder Woman, you got The Flash. The Flash is my favorite character of all time, you fucking dolts. You could have built a great movie. Instead, you gave us two inadequate movies and you spent an extra $30 million to give us the shittier inadequate movie. And now you say we can't even have more of that inadequate movie. That's nevertheless better. I just don't understand who's in charge of Warner Brothers. I'd I know they fired multiple people. I'd fire them over and over and over again until they can give us a good set of DC superhero movies. This is not entirely related uh, to the conservative policy convention, but the parallels, I think, are obvious. Scott, A, I don't care a whit about that. And second of all, second, although WandaVision was good. Thank you for the heads up on WandaVision. Right? It was very good. But um, took me to the third episode to dig it. But um, the um, but what you just said, do you really require this platform to make that point? Isn't that something that you could have put out a cranky tweet about or maybe a direct email to Warner Brothers. Like, do you think they're listening? And like, what is, who are you talking to? David, let me tell you a little something. Let me just uh, teach you for a moment about um, communications. All right. <laughs> when you feel strongly about something and your message is clear, you want to be consistent across all channels. Now I've used, Twitter, <laughs> I've used email. Right? The podcast is available to me. Later today, I'm going to be on radio with Evan Solomon. I will bring this up then. I I'm simply not willing to permit an issue this fundamental to my life. Go unmentioned and unpursued on any platform that I appear on. So I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're asking me to, to bring half a quart of milk to a party that needs a full quart, and I just won't do it. I'm not built that way. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Thank the two of you so much for this. What a blast this was talking. I want to thank Michelle Rample for coming on the show. You know, anytime somebody who's a non-liberal comes on this show, I'm always grateful that they trust it. Um, as, a, as a reasonable place to get their point of view out. And I hope she felt that way. I want to thank her for coming on. Thank the Air Quotes Media team and Metal Donkers Good for the production of this. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Tell us our presenting sponsor, CN and MDA, our additional sponsors for today's program. And Ray Martini, take us out with the Hurly Burly theme song. Hurly Burly. Woo!